Well, thank you so much for joining us, Seth. Um, it's a privilege to have you here. Uh, we know that you've done some excellent work at RAND uh, and that you have a forthcoming book coming up through Oxford University Press. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're just delighted that you're here to be able to impart some knowledge uh, to us on all matters insurgency and terrorism, which unfortunately seems to be in the news a lot more these days. So I think we'll get straight into that while we have you here. And, and what I wanted to ask you is, is with everything that's been happening, the shrinking of Islamic State and uh, political developments in the Middle East, how do you see the terrorist milieu evolving as Al-Qaeda and ISIS are fighting it out? And, and what do you think is going to happen in, in the short term? Well, I think one of the developments we're already seeing is uh, the control and the, the territory that the Islamic State holds is shrinking. It's shrunk a little bit in Libya. It's shrinking even more significantly in Iraq and Syria as uh, forces are pushing against it, Iraqi forces in, in Iraq, uh, U.S. and other allied forces, including Kurdish ones in Syria. It's shrinking in Afghanistan a little bit. But at the same time, we're seeing an increase in violence levels. So it is becoming less of an insurgent groups, uh, an insurgent group that controls territory, has an emirate, has an organizational structure that is state-like and more of a terrorist group that has a much smaller cell structure, doesn't control much territory, but uh, becomes increasingly involved in strikes outside of its area into Europe, into Turkey, uh, into North America, uh, into the Pacific, into Australia, as they try to inspire individuals to, um, to conduct attacks. And I, and, and I think, you know, uh, Al-Qaeda is not out of it yet. I think we still see an Al-Qaeda that uh, has strength in, in Syria, in Jabhat al-Nusra, in Yemen with Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, though it's mostly focused for the moment on the war in Yemen, uh, but does have an ability to, I think, resurge at some uh, future period. We may see uh, more fighting in a few places, including Syria. But I think for the moment, the Islamic State has taken the lead in inspiring attacks in a range of places. And that's what we've seen concerning in Orlando, if what we've seen concerning in France with uh, Nice, uh, including attacks that don't require weapons per se, but, but can use trucks. And I think that's more of what I expect to see as uh, the territory uh, of the Islamic State in particular shrinks, is these kinds of, of, uh, of uh, unconventional style attacks. I think it's really interesting that we're seeing that in the West and how that's playing out. You've just completed a book studying insurgency. So I'd be interested in, in, in how you see the insurgent environment, perhaps not in the West, and how the Islamic State might be seeking to perhaps destabilize countries or build up insurgency in those countries as a way of perhaps finding alternative territory mm -hmm. or just creating mayhem, as it seems want to do. Um, is there anything in your book in terms of that, that that you can help shed some light on what might happen in the future? Yeah, I think there are a couple of things of, of possible interest. One is uh, that we saw for a 40-year period during the Cold War from the late 1940s until around 1989, um, uh, uh, an increasingly larger chunk of insurgencies that were a Marxist-Leninist. And in part, that was because uh, the Soviets were providing assistance to insurgencies in Latin America and Asia and Africa and other locations. After the end of the Cold War, uh, the percentage of insurgencies that had some Marxist, Leninist, or broader communist um, bent to it had declined markedly. We, what we've seen uh, around the same time, a little bit later than 1989, closer to the end of the 90s, is a notable increase in the number of extremist Islamic insurgencies. And uh, in the early stages, it was mostly coming from places like Afghanistan and Pakistan. But we've seen it uh, spread. And we, we've seen a particularly notable increase in light of the Arab uprisings. Uh, as governments have weakened in several places and uh, groups have pushed in resources into those places. So, so, so we've seen a notable rise in the percentage of insurgencies across the globe that have an is, is extremist Islamic bent to them. And I think what, what we're looking at is, uh, is um, potential for increased spreading in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've seen it a little bit in North Africa. Uh, Libya uh, has now, I think, threatened 
Tunisia, which is really the poster child for the Arab uprisings. We've seen insurgencies uh, become more Islamic state in, involved in with Boko Haram in, in uh, West Africa. In East Africa, we still see very weak governments in Somalia, and so we see Salafi jihadist uh, insurgencies, particularly one led by al-Shabaab. So uh, I, I think what I'd expect to see is, um, is potentially the spreading of that into uh, the Pacific region. Um, so I think we'll keep our eye on uh, whether we see an increase in, uh, in Mindanao, for example, in the Philippines, where most of that insurgency uh, uh, started to decline in the 2000s. Um, so I think, again, the trends where they've come from have been an increase in uh, extremist Islamic insurgencies, in cl in including an increase in scope. And so I think, again, the a Africa, it's really West, North, and East Africa, parts of the Middle East and in the Persian Gulf, and I think inclu including in the uh, Pacific Rim, uh, we may see more uh, insurgencies start to spread as material fighters and money are pushed into some of those places. You've written some things on nation building as well in your time in insurgency. So I'd like to ask you to perhaps draw all this together in terms of you'd obviously have some ideas about what strategies and policies are working and what haven't worked in the past. Given that we know that a footprint on the ground can cause even further radicalization, how are we going to counter this spread of instability that we could reasonably forecast might be coming? And, and what would you be suggesting? What, what, what's your research in your book showing and, and what, what things can be done that aren't being done? Well, I think uh, one, one of the issues that looks like it is uh, it's not productive, in fact, it's counterproductive, is the use of large numbers of uh, external foreign outside forces, particularly conventional forces, to defeat insurgent groups in countries. It's been counterproductive. It was, I would say, counterproductive in Iraq. Uh, the whole invasion was counterproductive, but the large numbers of forces there are counterproductive. I think over time, counterproductive in Afghanistan as well. But what looks like it has been more successful in the 181 insurgencies I looked at, when an outside power was involved, is uh, very small numbers, more special operations uh, types of forces, um, uh, intelligence assistance to uh, governments on the ground, and then your non-military types of assistance, uh, diplomatic assistance and trying to help uh, negotiate settlements and deal with some of the political causes of uh, conflict. Because after all, most insurgencies are political first, military second. So groups actually can start insurgencies because they're able to, um, uh, they're, they're able to uh, latch onto grievances that local populations have. So uh, w again, one of the big pictures I think w uh, I've seen in looking at, at the 181 in insurgencies is um, that if you're going to assist in some of these countries, whether they're, whether it's East Africa, North Africa, the Pacific, the Middle East, is um, to uh, work with local partners on the ground, uh, not try and do it for them. The challenge, though, is what do you do with countries like Somalia, which has a very limited government uh, and no government in key areas, let's say, in the Juba River area in the south. And there are, there are some interesting solutions we've seen. Uh, in that case, it was building an African Union uh, force, uh, what, what's called Amazon, to deal with most of the military activity in those areas because Somalia is not strong enough. So there are some interesting, um, and, and, and so the Western component is assisting Amazon with train, advise, assist, and equipping them and helping them with some direct action, some intelligence surveillance, uh, so that they can provide that information to Amazon forces. So we have seen, in, even in cases where the government is, is um, uh, virtually non-existent, some solutions, temporary solutions, to weakening groups. And we've seen al-Shabaab, even in the Somalia context, go from controlling about 55% of the territory of Somalia in 2010 to about 5% or so today with this kind of a solution. So I, I think it's those kinds of uh, solutions, light footprint, mm -hmm. uh, dealing with political and economic issues that are the way um, we can make inroads in, into some of these countries. How do you see the challenge evolving for Europe uh, dealing with what's happening in Syria? I know your country and my country in particular are having some, some 
interesting and, and very heated conversations about immigration at the moment. Um, and obviously that's involving a lot of very desperate people trying to flee a war zone, but it's also involving the trafficking of humans. There's been some dreadful reports about young women ending up in slavery. Mm -hmm. How do you see, I suppose you could say there's that, there's that intermingling of transnational crime with insurgencies taking place on an unprecedented scale now as well with the facilitation of, of these movements of people and in slavery as well. What can we do about that type of thing? Is the United Nations, for example, the best avenue or do we need to be having a stronger footprint to prevent uh, you know, the inroad of transnational crime as well? Well, look, I think there are multiple organizations that are helpful. I think the uh, United Nations and various components of the United Nations are important. Um, I think there are elements of the World Bank and some of the uh, economic packages that the bank or the International Mo uh, Monetary Fund can put together that are important. Um, but one of the things I think that's helpful is, uh, and is, uh, is to um, make sure that that uh, steps, I in the European case, steps that governments are taking are not making the problem worse. So, you know, the, the, the issue with refugees, for example, is a, is a good one, and, and that is that the, uh, um, there's a lot of domestic opposition to having refugees in. When you look, though, at radicalization, including at um, terrorist activity, the refugee prop uh, population, for the most part, is not the biggest area of concern. What, what countries like France have had to deal with with the Paris attacks were French citizens or those from Belgium. They weren't refugees that were coming in. So I think, you know, that my concern is an overreaction in ways that alienate uh, populations that already exist in these areas. Um, some of the things that, that I've been most concerned about is, um, uh, so I is finding some of the key uh, countries Turkey is probably the best example where we see a lot of movement of fighters, of weapons, of money going through Turkey. And I think one of the things that we, we collectively can do a better job is finding the key nodes like Turkey and working collectively together to try to minimize a lot of the movement of material and uh, radical groups and organized criminal groups coming from places like Syria up into Europe and then back. So we do see a couple of key transit routes, Turkey being one uh, where I think we can put more resources into uh, monitoring borders, conducting intelligence surveillance, reconnaissance, dealing with communities in, a, in places like Turkey that I think actually help out uh, and have second and third order uh, effects in places like Europe. How, how do you think when we're looking at the evolution of insurgencies and, and also you know we're discussing the terrorist threat how important do you think it is for the youth demographic uh we're seeing a lot of young people that from the west from australia or america that just wanted to go and fight but yet when we look say at the paris attacks we're seeing 28 29 year olds being involved what's your sense of where we're heading with the general milieu, because to me that seems like we're up to generation three or four now since 9-11, and I know you've been doing work in this field uh, since then as well. So what's your take on where we're headed with these people that are already, I suppose, vulnerable to radicalization or in the milieu? What can we be doing better in that space to try and dampen down the, the tendency to want to go to these areas? That's a very good question. Or um, n not just go to some of these cases, but as we've seen uh, in, in some instances, conduct attacks in the countries where they're already operating. I mean, one of the areas uh, that is most concerning, without a doubt, and I think the, the Islamic State has taken advantage of this, is the use of social media. Uh, and we see pretty active pushes of information out to the younger generation, teens, 20-somethings, via Twitter, via Facebook, and via a whole range of other social media platforms. What we don't often see in those platforms is coordinated narratives from legitimate individuals pushing back. There is some. Uh, what I think is particularly missing is uh, messages to those same individuals from people that have e either lived under 
uh, the Islamic State in areas like Syria and Iraq that can tell from first-hand experience what life was like under this group. Or second, um, individuals that have defected from the organization that can talk about what life was like as members of the group. So what we've seen is in s successful cases, uh, if we take Saudi Arabia in the early 2000s, uh, it never actually made it to an insurgency. Saudi Arabia was able to dampen, um, in 2002, bin Laden pushed a number of cells into Saudi Arabia to start an insurgency. It never got going. It's an interesting example of an insurgency that never happened. But one of the Saudi uh, soft power approaches was uh, encouraging a range of individuals from Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula that had defected from the organization and getting their stories out onto uh, television into newspapers, radio, and then onto internet. And our, our, our treatment of these kinds of individuals, I think, in general, is to arrest them and throw them in prison. We don't give these people an outlet. So what I would suggest, one of the things we think about is giving a voice, and finding ways to give voices to people who have been there, can talk from a first-hand perspective about the downsides of life under groups like this. And I think that is missing from the debate. Governments are trying to do it for, uh, for to tell the narrative. They're not always the best kinds of organizations. They're not the most legitimate. But I'd like to see us reach out to people who, have, uh, who are what I would call primary source individuals. That's missing right now. I agree. I agree. And I think it's very challenging to do that when you've got a credibility issue if someone's prosecuted, for example, or then you've also got the issue of how to structure that in a way that it's effective. Which brings me to a slightly related issue. Um, one of my colleagues sent me an email today that suggested that the French are thinking of pushing back against media reporting and scaling back on the reporting of names and photographs of people that are involved in terrorism. And we've been having some discussions here about do we need to have another conversation about the impact of contagion in media reporting? You've been covering terrorism and insurgency for a long time. What's your sense on the whole amplification problem with media? And, and do you think that because we're seeing a less strategic coordination of terrorism now and, and these young men going off and doing that, that we do need to be more careful with how we're reporting and, and commenting on these issues? Uh, I, I think it's worth uh, thinking about uh, how uh, these kinds of terrorist attacks are being committed uh, and then the report, the media reporting that goes with it. I, I think the issue, though, is or at least one issue is I, I think in many of the countries we live in, it's going to be very hard, if not impossible, to uh, put together laws to govern what media can or cannot report. I mean, I think to take the U.S., for example, mm. I just don't see any kind of uh, future scenario where the media is going gonna, is gonna to operate under these sorts of guidelines. Uh, with, with one or two caveats, um, one of the things that still concerns me is the use of all of these social media platforms by a range of groups um, for strategic messaging, and recruitment and financing, but also operational and tactical, and that is real-time involvement in attacks and then tweeting it as they're mm -hmm. conducting attacks. How do we let that go on? I, I, I think, you know, it is worth, it may be worth uh, putting laws in place or putting more constraints on companies that have these social media platforms and finding ways to make sure that these kinds of terrorist groups aren't able to use these kinds of social media platforms for their strategic, operational, and tactical level uh, efforts. And that may mean clamping down on, on companies like Google in the U.S. Uh, and uh, penalizing them if we see groups repeatedly using their platforms for activity and they are unable to stop it. Uh, I mean, they're conducting criminal and terrorist activity using their platforms. There are ways to start to monitor and shut that stuff down. I, I actually don't think they have done as uh, good of a job in shutting down this kind of terrorist propaganda as they could. And I think, so I think we've, the, the, those areas are probably more like 
more likely to see some movement than um, trying to put constraints on our media, which I think many of our you know media networks are just not going to mm. not going to abide by that. Mm. Do you see the threat extending to media eventually if we start doing that type of activity and say you know Twitter's issued with things, Periscope, Facebook Live messaging? Uh, are we going to see target changes? Do you think towards you know if 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 those avenues are closed down, there has been a lot of talk recently about media personalities being targeted along with law enforcement and a range of areas. Um, which leads me to a more general question about what can we expect moving forward with targeting? Are, are we going to see that squeezing of the balloon effect that if we shut off one avenue of high visibility action or the use of a tool that it will spread? Or yeah, uh, it's unclear. I mean, I think again, if you look at um, the uh, social media forums that uh, a, n a number of these groups, particularly Islamic State, use, it's not that they're they're not using that large of a number. There are a finite number of platforms they use. I think if you squeeze them there, they will try to go elsewhere. But I think they'll have a harder time communicating with the teenagers and the twenty-somethings that they're trying to recruit, and either conduct attacks in their countries or to go to places like Iraq or Syria or new battlefields. Maybe we'll see Afghanistan rear up again or Libya. Um, but I think as, as I look towards the future, again, what I, what I would uh, am sort of most concerned about with the inspirational style attacks is less the kind of attacks that may focus at, say, media, and more um, really easy attacks uh, that target um, individuals without having to buy a gun. So one of the things that struck struck me about Nice, the Nice attacks, they've been talking about that kind of attack for some period. I mean, we've seen it in uh, Islamic State magazines and we've seen it in Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula magazines, including Inspire. But what's been different is that people have actually been doing it now. And so w we can see, uh, we've seen plots where individuals have bought ingredients and mixed them together and trying to uh, put together crude bombs and put them in public places. We've seen people use machetes and knives to kill uh, priests as we've just as we've seen recently in France. So I think it's the very unsophisticated style of attacks that uh, I think we'll see more of. Um, law enforcement, military forces and government officials are the prime target, but the secondary targets are just the public writ large. And I think that's my biggest concern. It's not specific focuses like media. It's everybody. Mm -hmm. It's public locations. It's trains. It's buses. It's public squares. It's parades uh, and celebrations like what we saw in Nice. I think that's where a lot of this is, is trending towards right now. One last question for you. Um, obviously, a lot of this has to do with, with the influence of, of the senior leadership of Daesh and what they're instructing young men to do. And if, if they're not directly taking instruction, obviously they're being influenced in their choice of targets by the reading material you've mm. mentioned. What do you see happening uh, when that top level of leadership is eventually taken out? Um, and, and what might we expect? It's a good question. So, you know, one of the interesting things is to look at some of the patterns, say, with Al Qaeda. So, after the death of Osama bin Laden in 2011, he was replaced by Ayman al Zawahiri. Zawahiri has been uh, not, not a very charismatic uh, leader. Uh, he has had a very difficult time inspiring people to conduct attacks in the name of Al Qaeda. If there are Al Qaeda inspired attacks, they tend to often to be individuals like Anwar al-Olaki, uh, and there are a lot of people who will still listen to his sermons, um, much more than the al-Qaeda leadership. And I, so I think we've seen al-Qaeda-inspired uh, attacks go down significantly over the past few years. What would be interesting to see is if uh, Baghdadi, for example, were to be captured or killed in the Iraq-Syria front, and we're, we were to see a, a decline in key leaders of Daesh or the, the Islamic State, is whether we'd have uh, a charismatic um, replacement that would be able to do it. That's hard hard to know because uh, because Baghdadi's replacement would be generally a committee decision, so there'd probably be two or three people that would have a serious possibility of taking that. One or two of them might be charismatic, but not necessarily. So I think part of the question is is for us to do analysis 
now on who would be a potential leader in place of Baghdadi and, and what the organization would look like. Uh, I think it'd be hard to replicate what Baghdadi has done over the past several years in leveraging social media and reaching out into uh, computers and homes across Australia, New Zealand, and, and North America and other places. So I think you know if the Al Qaeda lesson is any indication, uh, it's hard to get a leader in place that inspires people. I think w like what we've seen Baghdadi. Bin Laden had it to some degree, but we haven't seen it with predecessors. I don't even see it, even if you're to go down a few levels in Al Qaeda's leadership today, I just don't see it happening. I think the same is, is also true with with Daesh. Mm. And just to follow up on that one really last question, so what might that mean in terms of if there was uh, a split or some infighting, do you see the splintering of the insurgency even further or do you think that it's likely that because of perhaps the ideological basis for some of this activity that, that the group will remain in some form or another essentially congealed? Well, I think there are a couple of options. One is uh, is 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 a group like the Islamic State or Daesh that's been able to uh, recover from uh, a effective targeting of its leadership, able to put people in place that keep keep the networks in Africa and the Middle East and South Asia and the Pacific largely together. Uh, second would be a real serious decentralization. Uh, there are a lot of Salafi jihadist groups that either are formal branches, that is, they've pledged Bayat, and it's been reciprocated by Baghdadi in multiple locations, and informal, so there may be a pledging of Bayat, but it's not been reciprocated yet. Uh, we've seen that with Abu Sayyaf group in the Philippines. So in that second scenario, we'd see a, a decentralization of the Salafi jihadist uh, groups, and so you might see Ansar al Sharia's in Libya, in other places uh, you might see other Taliban in Afghanistan, and so you'd get this this collection of groups that just weren't very well coordinated. Um, there are other people who've looked at what it would take for uh, a merger between Daesh mm -hmm. and Al Qaeda. They come from very similar ideologies. Obviously, in fact, uh, Daesh came from uh, from Al Qaeda itself. They tend to have a bit more of an anti-Shia uh, tendency and a little bit more grotesque mm. uh, level of violence, of beheadings, than Al-Qaeda has generally been comfortable with. But there might be, depending on some key wild cards and factors, the potential at some point down the road for a merger of groups. So I think we could see, we could see still some scenarios where I'd see two major movements, Daesh and Al-Qaeda, some where we see sort of decentralization of that, and some potentially with a with a merger of uh, of those organizations. I think those are all uh, possible scenarios for the future. One really last question: <laughs> with those scenarios in mind, do you think the Islamist State experiment is essentially come to an end as Daesh is starting to constrict and uh, it's losing territory? Do you see that the I suppose? Uh, you know, the high level of gloss that it had, say, 12, 14 months ago. Do you think that will ever be able to be replicated or is that group on the decline in terms of the prestige of a state? I, look, I think it's on the decline for now uh, in some key areas. I think it's certainly possible, and we've seen it, resurge in the future. I think one of the things that gives me most concern right now is uh, the military steps against this organization are moving much faster than political and economic ones. And so if you take Iraq, uh, that uh, the group has already lost territory in Anbar, parts of Fallujah and Ramadi, uh, not Mosul yet, uh, but some of the key political grievances that have caused Sunnis to support groups like Daesh, uh, like JRTN, um, have not been fixed yet. We still have a lot of animosity directed at a government of Baghdad as viewed as too close to Iran, that's too pro-Shia, uh, some territory that's already been taken back by Shia mobilization groups uh, in these areas. And so, I mean, I would certainly see at some point if, if these, fact, if, if these uh, political and other economic issues aren't fixed, and, and there are a whole range of other ones in, in countries like Syria, where we have 
uh, very serious political and economic problems that haven't been fixed, is you could get a 2.0. Mm. Uh, I don't know what the name of that group would be, but it would take advantage, uh, for example, of serious Sunni grievances in Anbar and other heartlands, and it comes back with a vengeance at some future period. So uh, I think if the last couple of years have showed us anything, it is uh, we can take military steps against these groups, take territory back from them. But if we aren't dealing effectively with the political, economic, social grievances that, that, are, that, that, that are causing the grievances in the first place, uh, that what we may do is just see various forms of this reemerge in the future. And I, yeah, there are plenty of countries that fit into this mix. Mm -hmm. If the West withdraws too quickly from Afghanistan, I think you've got issues. I think if, if you don't have, see that kind of progress in Libya right yeah. now, you see potential issues there. So I think by no means are we out of this. And I, I would say by no means um, is this trend line going to continue of uh, decline in territorial control for the, f for the uh, interminable future? We may see a, a resurgence at some point. Well, on that slightly depressing note, I yeah. think we might call it uh, quits. But thank you very much for your time today, Seth. That's been really interesting. Thank you very much.